In Jesus' name. Amen. So we are going to look at Closer to My Closet. And that this is a message that has been in my heart for the last three weeks that I've been out and locked down, you know, being locked down, not going to job, not going to work, not being free out there, having businesses closed and everything. This is a message that has sat in my heart and it's something that I deeply feel about it. And I'm not here to teach us about how to pray because the disciples asked Jesus, teach us how to pray, and Jesus taught them how to pray the Lord's Prayer. I have not come to teach you how to pray. Because I know all of us, in some way, we do pray. We pray in our own special ways. Some of us pray for hours. Some of us pray for minutes. Some of us pray for very long days. But all in all, we all know how to pray. But today, it is not about just prayer. But it's about our relationship with our Father. Our relationship with our God. If you notice, before this COVID-19, people didn't have what we call time. There was no time, totally. No time for services. No time for friends. No time for family. But this thing has given us time. All we have in our house is 24 hours of sitting. And I must say that sitting for over 20 hours in a house and sleeping for a few hours because we worry much, this one may bring a lot of room for us to do things that are not godly. But I am here to remind us that there is a closet Jesus says that you will enter into your room and you pray. Enter into the closet and you pray. And today I want, us, I want to call us back into our prayer closets. Because in this place, it is the place where we can have a personal fellowship with our Father. He is our God. So, can we find in our hearts to open our minds and to be able to obey this word. That by the end of this, we will be inspired to revive our prayer closets to revive our private prayer lives. Let me say this, on a, maybe on a lighter note, but let me just say this. It is very easy for us to pray proudly, and I want to repeat that word proudly, because Jesus said these people are praying, and one of them was praying very proudly, the Pharisee and the tax collector. One of them was praying very proudly. We can find the story in the book of Luke. Chapter 18, verse 9 to 14. It is a parable that Jesus gave. He said a Pharisee came and he was praying loudly. And he was praying how righteous he was. How he pays his tithe. How he's better than other people. And even pointing to the tax collector saying, I am even better than this one. So prayer became a sort of competition. Even sometimes sadly to us believers. So it is very easy for us to pray proudly and be on fire in public and be dead cold in our closets. Let me ask you this question. How cold is your closet? What was the last time you just went into your closet and just prayed? And you know, amid this COVID-19 that people are going through, many people are getting very tired, sick and tired, and they are not even praying. So it is just a message to revive our private prayer lives. That instead of being on fire in public alone, let us also be on fire in the private place. We are doing this because Jesus himself valued the private prayer life. We are reading in many, many scriptures, the Bible tells us that Jesus left his disciples. And he went alone to be alone in the mountains and pray. To be alone in the caves and pray. To be alone in a place and pray. To be alone in Gethsemane and pray. Jesus valued his prayer life. And a very good example in Mark chapter 9, the Mount of Transfiguration. We remember this story. Jesus went to this place and he went with the three people that he loved praying with. And this is Peter, James, and John. He loved praying with these three. So he went to the Mount of Transfiguration and when he reached there, he prayed. And after his prayer, we know what happened in the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus was transfigured and Peter was there and he said, can we build an altar, one for Moses, Elijah, and one for you, Jesus? That is what he was thinking because the prayer life of Jesus was so fruitfully awesome. But Jesus said, no, 
Now, after that, they came out of the prayer, and when they went back to the public, we found the other disciples. Let me call the nine other disciples. They had really struggled to cast out demons. They struggled and they failed. And the father to the boy came and said, Jesus, I, <clears throat> you are people. You are disciples. You are Christians. You are church people have failed to do this. They have failed to cast out the demon. They have tried and failed. But when Jesus spoke to the demon, it obeyed and went. So we see that the private prayer life of Jesus was manifested powerfully in public. If we want to be powerful, even in our declaration against sicknesses and disease, if we want to be effective in our prayer life, we must have a private prayer life. We can take some hours of the 24 hours that we have today. In some countries, there is a total lockdown, no going outside. In some places, there is curfew. It is a good time. Let us look at it as a blessing to go back to the prayer closet and just seek the face of God and fellowship with God our Father. Because that is what he desires. Right from the book of Genesis. He came to have fellowship with Adam and Eve and found Adam and Eve in self-condemnation. They said, Lord, we had you coming and we ran away. Maybe you are in a, a self-condemning Board. You are thinking you are the person who even introduced this COVID-19 just because you sinned. No. The will of God is that we go back to the prayer life that we had. Now when I speak like this and I say that Jesus went to the mountain and we say Jesus went to a private place and he went to Mount Olives. He went to pray and he was transfigured in remote places. Some of our places and some of our areas we don't have mountains. We can't even go out to the mountains and you're telling me I have a perfect excuse not to have a prayer closet because there are no mountains and we are on lockdown. What does a prayer room mean? What does your closet mean? It's just a place where you can have your private time with God and pray. It can be right in the middle of your sitting room. It can be in your kitchen. This is the place where you can say, I am going to have a private prayer time with my God. This is a place where we don't call God another person. We call him our father. This is the place where God becomes a personal father. We call him Abba. This is a place where God has come to us. Doesn't it surprise us that when Jesus was teaching the Lord's prayer, he did not come and say, now when you pray, say this, O master of the heavens and the universe. He didn't say that. He didn't even use the word Lord. What he said is, Our Father who art in heaven. So when we go to this private place, it is a place in your heart. It is a spiritual place where you can relate closely to God, our Father. And why should we do this? Because there are three most important things that we get when we go to have a private prayer time with our God. Number one, we always have access to the Father. Number two, we have assurance that the Father is with us. And number three, it is the place where we obtain the authority to subdue principalities and powers. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 4 and verse 16, the Bible asks us, believers mostly, and even non-believers, the Bible asks us to do this. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. The prayer room, the prayer closet is a place where all heavenly providence has been released. Has been availed for us. That we may be able to access them. So how do we access? It says come boldly. You cannot come with condemnation. You are a child of God. You are a son of God. The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, child of God, come to the prayer room, to the private prayer place. Come boldly. Don't come with judgment in your heart. Don't come with condemnation. Come with a clear conscience. Knowing that you're not coming to the master of the universe. You are coming to Abba Father. 
Hallelujah. The Bible says when you come to this place boldly, you will obtain mercy. I love looking at the Bible and the use of words in the Bible. The Bible says this place is where we obtain mercy. This is a place where we obtain loving kindness. This is a place where we go. It's like you're going to a shop. When you go to this shop, you can obtain something. You can purchase something. So this mercy of God is there. But we have to give our life to receive it. Buana, if you son. We have to give our lives, to give our thinking, to give our all to receive the mercy. To say, God, I humble myself before you. I am nothing without you. I am broken in your presence, Father, that I may receive your mercy. When we humble ourselves, we obtain the mercy of God. The Bible tells us that when my people were called by my name, when they come to me, when they humble themselves and pray and uh, turn away from, the, from their evil ways, the Bible says we must humble ourselves. But not only that, it also says we will obtain mercy and we will find grace. When we find something, we don't buy it. We find it. We, I hear people pre- playing a game that they say finders keepers. I found this, this water belongs to Pastor Alfred and I, I keep it. I found it. I found something. I didn't buy it. So we don't buy grace. The moment we obtain mercy from God, the moment we are forgiven of our sins, the moment we are reconnected with God our Father, we find grace. Grace is poured upon us and grace is the undeserved favor of God that we receive from him. Why do we receive these two things? The Bible says we will find grace to help us in time of trouble. Hallelujah. You may be in a trouble right now when you find the grace of God. I, this brings to my mind the situation of Paul. He was in trouble and he went to God to pray. Three times he went to pray to God. Three times he found an answer that said no. You have prayed and fasted for COVID to live and still the answer is wait or no. Not yet. God says not yet. But the Bible says his grace is sufficient. This is the time to ask for the grace of God. When we go to the prayer cross, we also find God's will. Because he speaks to us on what he needs, on what he wants, on how we pray. The Bible says we pray and we do not receive because we ask amiss. Sometimes we ask for our own gain. We ask amiss, not according, not in line with God's word. And therefore, we fail. But from the prayer closet, we pray God's will in the name of Jesus. We say the second thing that we get when we go to the presence of the Lord is assurance. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 16, The Bible says, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. It bears witness that we are sons of God. So we have assurance when we go to God our Father. We have total assurance that number one, we are sons of God. That we can call out Abba Father. Number two, we have assurance that God is always with us and most importantly we have God we have assurance of God's plan on earth because God will speak to us what does he say in the book of it Micah chapter 7 verse 7 he says he will not Micah chapter 7 okay the Bible says this that he doesn't do anything unless he has revealed it to his sons the prophets so we are the children of God we are the sons of God we are the chosen Generation, God is ready to reveal to us exactly what is happening at such a time as this. But the problem is, or the question is, are you in that private prayer place with your father? Are you close to your closet? That he may be able to reveal to you so that when you post on Facebook, you post God's plan. So that you post on Twitter, you tweet God's plan. So that when you are live, like on Facebook here, we are doing it in God's plan. We are giving you God's plan. His plan for us will never change. He has good plans for his people. And that is the plan of God. And that is the assurance that we need. We don't need to condemn ourselves and say, oh, we are bad. God is punishing us. Oh, we are doomed. Our country is finished. Oh, our doctors are finished. No. God's plan will always be God. 
That is why we always declare in greeting and we say, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Not because he wants to, but because it is his nature. He will never change. Then from the prayer closet, now we have the authority. We find the authority. When we go back to the story where Jesus cut the Mount of Transfiguration and the cast of the demon in the, the occurrence in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 19 to 20. The Bible says in verse 19, then his disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said to them, it was because of your unbelief. For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and this mountain will move. And lastly, the Bible says, the line says, and nothing will be impossible for you. From the place of a prayer closet, it is a place where we find authority. Look at how Jesus is teaching his people to pray. He's saying, don't have repetitious words, vain repetitious words. It doesn't mean don't repeat the words and the statements in your prayer. When Jesus was at Gethsemane, three times he prayed, and the Bible says he prayed the same prayer three times. Praise be to Jesus. It is not about the statements you are, you are repeating, but if you're praying a vain prayer, it is repeating what God has already done over and over and over and over and over again. You are just saying, God, maybe God has already given you the answer, and you continue coming to God. God, forgive me. God has forgiven you. Tomorrow again, God forgive me. So every morning you're waking up, sometimes I ask my children, like yesterday I was asking my children, dress up nicely so that we can just take a photo. We don't have to stay in our night dresses the whole day long. Be cheerful in the house, in the house where you live. Praise the Lord in the places where you don't have to be gloomy. Because when we come from a place of a prayer, we know that God has already done something good for us. And we come with authority as children of God. So that even our relationship with our spouses, let it not be about COVID-19. Let your relationship be a relationship of love and authority. Even with your children. Let that be the authority. We have authority at that level. Authority is not just prayer. Authority is I have been mandated to do this and I am sure I'm mandated to do this. We are mandated to preach, to love, to share. That is the mandate that God has given unto us. So we do it with authority. It is the power given unto us and we use it well. That is authority. So, Jesus is teaching the prayer and he says, when you come, look at what Jesus is asking us to do today even as we finish. Jesus is asking us to do what many Christians will say it is pride. Jesus is saying, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Then he says this, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is not saying, may your will come. It is not saying, God, we beg for your kingdom to come. We are just ushering in the will and the purpose of God on earth. God is waiting for a people who will arise and usher in the will and the purposes of God on us, in our houses, in our churches, in the body of Christ, even in the internet. We need to usher in the will of God. We are the ushers of the Father's kingdom. And also, we are the ones to pray God's will on us. When we understand that place, when we have accessed the Father, when we have that access to the Father, He gives us the assurance that gives us the authority. Without that, we cannot have the authority to do anything. We could not have the authority even to praise His holy name. But we are asking that in the name of Jesus, be the person to usher the will of God upon the earth. Be the person to pray God's will upon the earth. In the name of Jesus. Jesus.